Hey guys, welcome back to another Kubernetes video. Today we're going to be talking about the API server. This is another video in our Kubernetes control plane series. So let's jump right into it. So let's uh, do a little recap on what the API server in Kubernetes does. It handles the communication with the cluster and between cluster components. So what do I mean by that? Essentially, when we are an external entity, we communicate with the cluster via the API server, but also internally to the cluster, all of the different components use the API server as a point of communication. So you can see here, our controller manager communicates with the API server, our data store, etc. D, our scheduler, and then our node agents, kubelet and kube proxy. If this is something that is not already familiar to you, then I would suggest that you go back and look at my first control plane video where I explain from a high level how the control plane operates. But in this video, we're going to get into a little bit more detail on how specifically the Cube API server works. It provides a REST interface, which means that the requests that go into the API server are in a HTTP uh, format and we essentially provide different routes that we can perform different operations on generally get requests, um, updates, deletes, and um, lists. So it handles authentication and authorization. So authentication is a process of determining who is trying to contact the API server. Authorization is a process of determining what they can do within our cluster. So we might know that a particular person is named Joe is trying to contact our cluster. The process of determining that they that is actually Joe. So for example, they might want to provide some sort of certificate or a password. That is the authentication process, but then determining, okay, they can read certain objects, but they can't create new objects determining that and the level of permissions that they have, that's the authorization process, just uh, if, you, if you weren't aware. So we have a whole bunch of API paths, as you could probably imagine. Um, there are two core paths that we have within um, the Kubernetes API. The first one is slash API. The second one is slash APIs. So all of the original objects like pods, services, are defined within slash API. And the newer objects like jobs or daemon sets are defined in slash APIs. And essentially the difference is that in slash APIs, those objects are grouped. We do have to utilize namespaces when we're accessing the Kubernetes API, similar to when we use kubectl, we just add to the path the particular namespace that we want to specify. And we also specify that we are in slash namespaces because there are certain objects like namespaces that aren't namespaced. And then if we are using the slash APIs path, then we're going to be using the API group as well. Same thing, we have an API version as we have here. We have namespaces. Um, the only difference there is that we also specify the group. So if we want to explore the API paths within our Kubernetes cluster, we can actually do that quite easily if we just open up a command line. And assuming we are logged into our cluster using kubectl, we can just run kubectl proxy that will give us this endpoint that we can go to within our browser and have a look around and see what the um, API actually looks like. So if we do that, we can have a look and we can see, first of all, if we just go to the root directory, we have all of these different paths that we can have a look down. Uh, let's start with slash API slash V1 what we have in here. So now we can see we have a list of different types of resources like bindings, 
component statuses, config maps. Um, if we want to just look at pods, see what happens here. Well, we have a, a list of pods, and these would be the pods in the default namespace because we haven't actually um, specified a namespace. So if we go back, look at namespaces. We can look at our test namespace and then have a look at pods. So we can look in here and we see that we have just the one pod in this namespace and it's called nginx. So we can come in here and look at the actual JSON specification of our pods, of our singular pod. So we have the name, we have the namespace, and we have a bunch of different fields that are generated by Kubernetes itself. These are not fields that we have specified when we're creating our YAML file. Our YAML will be quite quite a simple uh, definition, but here we have things like the um, particular networking manager that we're using. In our case, it's Calico. Um, also, the fact that we're using Kubelet and a whole bunch of other different fields that are relevant to our backend Kubernetes. So if we were to run that in kubectl, what would we get back? We can look at the pods as we did before. We see that we have this particular pod, so we can go kubectl get pods, boom. Then we'll have a look at the status, it's running. And then if we want to actually get the YAML for that pod, just go here and we get the the more detailed YAML, um, you know, the particular container we're running, uh, and then some status about the pod in its current state. Okay, so when we look at the API as we had back here, you may see that there are different, let me see. Okay, it's not listed on the home page, but there are different API designations that we can use. The first one is V1 Alpha. This is for unstable and newly developed objects or resources. It's generally not recommended to be used in production as it might be uh, buggy. The second is V1 Beta. And generally these are stable, but they may have bugs or imperfections. Um, they can be used in production, but uh, it's just a warning to the user that they they may not be completely perfect yet. And then finally, there is the V1, and these are generally available um, resources or APIs, and these are fully production ready. They've been tested for probably an extended period of time, and they're ready to be used in production. Now let's have a look at the life cycle of a request. The first step is authentication. As I mentioned before, authentication is the process by which we determine the identity of who is making the request to our API. There are a couple of different routes that we can go in terms of authentication. The first one is local. These are Kubernetes native methods of authentication. The first accepted is client certificate, bearer tokens, and HTTP basic authentication, although the latter is not recommended as it's not as secure as the other options. The second method we could take is pluggable. So there are various Kubernetes plugins that we can use for authentication. They're not native to Kubernetes, but there are plugins available. So couple of examples are OpenID Connect and Azure Active Directory. Then finally, we can completely outsource our authentication to remote webhooks. And this will essentially hand it off to a third party and the third party will return the um, tokens or certificates that we require to continue with the um, you know, request. And, service the user. Next is RBAC slash authorization. 
as I mentioned, this is how we determine what a user can do. So to put it in words, we determine if the identity has the required role to perform the requested action on the requested resource. So the identity is the person or service count that we have identified in the authentication step. Then we have to determine if that their role that they have can perform the action that they want to perform on the resource that they want to perform their action on. The next step is admission control. This is where we determine whether the request is allowed to occur. Um, we potentially apply modifications to the request in this component. And if an error is found, the request is rejected. So admission control is a phase of the request where we implement interceptors that can perform various types of filtering or different functionality upon the, the request. It's highly extensible. So this is something where we can write our own logic to create new admission controllers. Um, but it is essentially another layer of filtering and processing that allows us to determine if our request is valid. The final step is validation. And here we ensure the resource included in the request is actually valid. So if we wanted to create a new pod or a new service, so we have to determine that the resource that is defined in the request is actually valid. So you can imagine if we're sending up a malformed YAML or something with our kubectl request, and that is going to get rejected at the validation stage. Now, our, our previous couple of slides, we were looking at standard requests and standard APIs, but there are a couple of specialized requests that are slightly more complex and require additional functionality on top of our generic REST API format. And these are proxy, exec, attach, and logs. So the simplest to understand would be the logs example. So when we are trying to retrieve the logs from a particular container, we may want to access that container and keep the logs open. In this case, we're just keeping the HTTP request open. And as the new logs come in, they're sent back via the container through Kubelet, through the API server and back to the client. However, with exec, proxy and attach, we're actually leveraging WebSockets, which allow us to perform bi-directional data streaming. So you can imagine if we are interacting with a container, we want to be able to constantly send data and also constantly retrieve that data. And how we achieve that is via these WebSockets. On top of the WebSockets protocol, Kubernetes have also built a functionality for allowing multiple concurrent streams of data in either direction using a single WebSocket session. So you can imagine if you are in an exec session, you would need three streams of data to perform whatever actions you need to perform. Those would be standard in, standard out, and standard error. So, so in this case, we'd have three separate streams sending data to the container and back from the container um, currently. So that is an additional piece of functionality that Kubernetes have implemented on top of WebSockets. Finally, we have the watch API. So this allows a particular client to monitor changes rather than constantly polling and trying to determine if there were changes made to the cluster state. 
So you can imagine this will be useful for tools that implement a GitOps model. So what that means is that in a lot of production environments, we will actually define our Kubernetes manifests in a GitHub repository and then use a tool in order to continually ensure that what we have defined in our GitHub repository is matched in our actual, in our actual cluster state. So we can leverage the watch API in such uh, scenarios so that we can easily fix any differences between desired state and our actual current state. Finally, there are internal control loops that the API server has to service itself rather than utilizing a controller like we have mentioned before. Normally this would be all handled by a particular controller in the controller manager component of the control plane. But for things like custom resource definitions, then we, <coughs> but for things like custom resource definitions, this is actually handled itself by the API server. So the controller for adding custom resources, again, as I mentioned, is defined within the API server. The API server must know how to serve new paths. So it just makes sense for that logic to be contained within the API server itself. And thus it's co-located, as I mentioned. Okay, so that is it for this particular video. I hope that was useful for you guys. If you have any questions at all, please leave a comment and I'll get back to you. Please like and subscribe and I will talk to you in the next video.